let's put a bit more meat into this discussion and let's start with the data plane. Let's see how a typical overlay virtual networking solution would work and this applies more or less to all of them. So all of them work more or less the same. The VM that's trying to talk to another VM thinks it's connected to an Ethernet segment and it thinks it has an Ethernet network interface card. So what will it do? It will just send a regular Ethernet packet with IP payload and MAC header. When that packet goes through the virtual switch and hits the encapsulation code below the switch, in this particular case VXLAN, but it could be anything else, the VXLAN code adds an envelope around this IP packet generated by the VM. In VXLAN case, it would be a VXLAN header and then UDP header because VXLAN runs on top of UDP. And now comes the crucial question. Where do I send this? And I'll just hand wave over it for a moment and then later I'll tell you how NSX does that. So let's assume we know what to put as the destination IP address in the transport IP header, which is added here. And when we create the whole transport IP packet, we can send it over into the network. And now the transport network can have as many routers and subnets as you wish. So it doesn't matter what's in there as long as it can transport IP. And eventually the packet arrives on the other end, it hits the IP stack in the destination hypervisor. Based on destination UDP port number, the hypervisor knows that this belongs to VXLAN encapsulation module, sends the packet there, the IP envelope is stripped, the UDP header is stripped, VXLAN header is used to find the segment number. So now the virtual switch knows for which segment this packet is. Then the virtual switch checks the destination MAC address in the payload packet and delivers that to the destination VM. As I said, the crucial question is, how do we get the mapping between VM MAC addresses and hypervisor IP addresses? And I'll show you how that works with NSX. Before going there, there are at least three encapsulations out there Two years ago, we were arguing which one is the better one, and turns out that that was more or less a meaningless discussion. Some products today support two or even all three of them, and although they are competing and you can't interchange them if the product doesn't support it, in principle, they are all the same. So in all cases, we have an outer IP header and in all cases, we have an inner payload, and these two things are always the same. Every single encapsulation you use will have these two entities. The real difference is here in the middle. One of them uses GRE that we know very well from GRE tunnels if you had to implement them. The other one uses UDP and then VXLAN header, and the third one creates a fake TCP header. None of these three are supported by legacy networking hardware, so you cannot just terminate these packets on a existing switch. There are a few vendors that started supporting VXLAN. You may get something to work with GRE encapsulation, but I haven't heard of anyone supporting NVGRE in existing hardware yet. STT is not supported in any hardware that I know of, so they're pretty much the same from that perspective. Also, within the data center, none of this has any security features. So we depend on the underlying transport infrastructure to be totally secure. If the underlying transport infrastructure is not secure, we have a problem, and regardless of which encapsulation you use, you always can insert packets into a virtual network if you get access to the transport network. So really what matters is the control plane. I already got an interesting question. Why are we running virtual networks over TCP? Won't running it over TCP cause performance issues? 
We are not running it over TCP. STT is just reusing TCP headers. It's not establishing a TCP session. There's a really good reason for that. And to explain that, I have to go into the details of how TCP offload works. Traditionally, the application would send large chunk of data to the TCP stack, and the TCP stack would slice that data into TCP segments and send individual packets to the NIC. And the network interface card would send those packets to the network. Now, that generates obviously a lot of overhead for very large packets, and it generates even more overhead if you have to do this in hypervisors, because in the hypervisors, you have to emulate the NIC unless you use things like SRIOV, for example. So what the NIC vendors did was they implemented something called TCP offload, where an oversized TCP packet is sent straight to the NIC together with some metadata that is used to build the layer 2 header. And today's NICs support only VLAN tags in the metadata. So what you can add to the MAC header that was generated by the TCP stack within the VM, in our case, is only a VLAN tag. So the physical NIC can take this long packet, slice and dice it into smaller TCP segments, but it can only do it if you're running over VLANs. Now, what NSX does is it emulates the TCP offload. So Open vSwitch, when presenting a virtual NIC to the application, presents it as a TCP offload NIC, so it gets the full packet, and then it inserts the full packet as payload into another fake TCP header, and now it can send this large fake TCP packet down to the NIC, to the physical NIC, and the physical NIC will do what it does with the TCP offload, which is it will slice what looks like a TCP segment into multiple TCP segments. So obviously, in the first segment, you will get the original layer 2 header and then some application data. And in the subsequent segment, you will get some more application data and so on and so on and so on. STT is used solely because today's interface cards cannot do TCP offload for any other encapsulation type. There are NIC cards coming on the market that will do TCP offload with VXLAN encapsulation. When they appear and when you have it in your server, then you will be able to do TCP offload with VXLAN. Today, if you have performance critical application, it's better if you use STT. And now, coming back to the fundamentals, let's try to answer the question, how do we know which transport network IP address to use if we want to send the traffic to a particular VM? And how will the source hypervisor find that out? Isn't OTV another option to extend layer two domains between data centers? It absolutely is. Now, opinions differ, but I would not use any of these encapsulations to stretch my cloud across two data centers. There is an option that we'll discuss later on, how you can build stretched layer two segments with NSX, and I'll explain how that's done, not that I would support it, but I would not use any of these solutions straight out of the box to stretch my layer two segments across two data centers, because you are hitting a number of other problems like ingress routing, egress routing, you can end up with a broken substretch subnets and so on. Is NSX option only as DCI? As I just said, this is primarily a product that addresses the requirements of large scale clouds within a single data center. It has option to extend, for example, to a customer premises data center to link the two segments, but this is not the primary focus of this product. Next question, if STT is good, why not stay with that? Why go back to VXLAN? The 
problem is that STT fakes TCP headers, so every single security tool starts generating alerts. It's cleaner to go and layer things properly instead of reusing TCP, which is really not a TCP session, go and do it over UDP, for example. So over a protocol that was designed and is understood by everyone to be datagram oriented. Do top of rack vendors support STT encapsulation? Not that I'm aware of. So I haven't heard of anyone that would do that. How will firewalls handle STT if it changes TCP header? STT should not go through firewalls. Firewalls will probably just drop it because you don't have the initial TCP SIM packets and the segment numbers would be all wrong. So no, do not try to pass STT through a firewall. Does STT affect ECMP? Absolutely. That was one of the reasons why they use TCP. So if you have something riding on top of TCP or UDP, then you can hash the inner payload into 16 bits and you place that into outer source TCP or UDP header to increase the entropy so that traffic between two hypervisors can be load balanced across multiple paths across the network core. I haven't seen any switches from major vendors that would allow you to look into GRE header and do the same. If you know one, please let me know. Next, if top of rack supports offloading VXLAN, do you recommend VXLAN encapsulation over STT? I would use STT if I would be concerned about performance. If you want to have hardware gateways with the outside world, then you have to use VXLAN today. To add a little bit more color to a previous question that was asked about uh, the encapsulations, whether you should pick STT or VXLAN, it is possible to have both encapsulations running in a deployment at the same time. So, for example, the NSX controller can tell two hypervisors to talk STT to each other, but if there's a flow going from a hypervisor to a top of rack switch hardware gateway, then that flow can use VXLAN. I'm getting a number of questions on QoS. Most of the questions go along the lines of, do we get DSCP visibility in the transport network? And yes, the answer is you do. So NSX for multi-hypervisors has two options. Either it can take DSCP value that was set by VM and copy that into the transport header or it can ignore the DSCP value and set its own DSCP value in the transport header. So NSX for multi-hypervisors uses sort of, if you wish, service provider model, where you either trust your customer because he's paying you to trust him, or you don't trust your customer and you set the QoS values on your own. NSX for vSphere, is slightly different because there with vSphere 5.5, you will have the capability for full five tuple matching and marking. And with that, you will be able to set DSCP on the overlay traffic to anything you wish in the hypervisor. And that DSCP value is then copied into the transport envelope. Do you need jumbo frames in the transport network? I should have mentioned that, of course you do. If you want to transport 1500 byte IP MTU across VMs and you really want that, you don't want to play with the MTU sizes on the VMs, then you need something like 1600 MTU in the transport network. The other one are TTLs copied as well from the overlay into the transport network. No, they should not be copied because the overlay network is in let's say layer two case, emulating a single layer two subnet. So you should really not copy TTL from the VM traffic into the underlay traffic because you want the transport fabric to be able to transport the data to the other hypervisor regardless of how many hops are in there. And you also don't want to copy the transport TTL back into the VM TTL 
because that would break the layer two subnet mechanism. And when we do distributed routing, then of course we have to decrement TTL to prevent forwarding loops. Next one, since we can't use firewalls with STT and the encapsulation technologies don't have any security today, and physical network needs to provide security, what's your recommendation to do that without firewalls? Well, you see, it's the same situation as what you have today in your data center. You're transporting data between VMs and it's on a VLAN and it's unencrypted. So it's completely the same thing. If someone breaks into your data center, connects to the core, he can start inserting data into any VLAN. Nothing has changed. You just have to remember that stretching these things across one network is not always a good idea. If you stay within one physical facility, and if you keep the transport VLAN totally isolated, then you don't have that much of a security issue. Is it possible to encrypt all data plane communication? For example, you're doing something at a co-location site or in public cloud, and that would be probably a huge performance hit, right, Brad? So what we're doing today, I think you've already laid this out, Ivan, is that there is no encryption hypervisor to hypervisor within the data center, but we're encrypting the communication that goes between sites with IPsec. Encryption between hypervisors within the data center is you know, something that we're considering, so it might be something that comes later on. To find other virtual networking, data center, and cloud networking webinars, visit ipspace.net.